Okay. So everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming on behalf of Hope Library. We're really uh, grateful for the opportunity to offer this presentation about, um, I didn't snip this winter, is it too late to spray? And now what do I do about brown tail moth? Our guest speaker tonight is Lynn Holland. She's with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And this presentation is becoming pretty ubiquitous around the state of Maine now, especially in the coastal counties. So um, I'll do a little spiel at the end about Hope Library um, and all that we do, but I wanna turn it over to Lynn. Before Lynn starts, uh, everyone, if you have a question, please drop it in the, in the chat and uh, we'll take all questions um, as best we can at the end of the presentation. If there is a question dropped in the chat that seems just uh, something of the moment and really needs to be raised, um, I'll do that. But otherwise, uh, Lynn will present and then we'll have our Q&A. So take it away, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me to do this presentation. I know it's a really timely topic. And when you all asked me, it seemed like, oh, we haven't had that many calls about this. But just this week, this very question has come up multiple times because one of my um, duties as a horticulture professional with the extension is to answer client questions. And brown tail moth is certainly a very hot topic at this time. It's, um, it's been around for about seven years now. The first uh, time people saw it was in 2013. That was a reoccurrence. It's actually been in the area since the 1890s and it tends to come in waves. Unfortunately, this wave is higher and bigger and more spread out than past waves have been. So it's become a bigger problem for everyone in the state, um, not just the coastal counties, but I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So what can you expect from me tonight? I'm gonna to give you some practical, practical ideas about living with brown tail moth this summer because it's a fact, it's going to be one of the worst seasons we have seen, and certainly the worst in this wave of brown tail moth. What not to expect, we're not gonna talk about eradicating brown tail moth. Um, I am a, a licensed pesticide applicator, but I cannot give recommendations of chemicals in a general forum like this. And I'm really not even qualified to answer those questions. We really recommend that if chemicals are your choice for dealing with this, you need to talk to a professional who has seen your yard, who understands your infestation, and who can hopefully guide you along on the process of what will work best and when it will work best. Because this pest is heavily dependent on timing. So the first thing we tell everyone is know your nemesis, because honestly, this time of year, hairy caterpillars are pretty prevalent throughout the state. And it's really important to know which ones you have to worry about and which ones you don't. Um, certain uh, of the pests really aren't a problem. They look horrible. It's kind of scary looking, but they're really not a big problem. Oops. Tent caterpillar, which is the Eastern tent caterpillar and the fall webworm have been around in this area are natives actually to this area and pretty prevalent throughout the state. And you're gonna see these in many types of trees including the same trees that brown tail moth like. So therefore, when you're looking at your crab apples, your cherries, your apples, your pears, um, it's often you will see these tent caterpillars. Sometimes you'll also see them in lower shrubs, but when you see them, there's no need to panic. Even when you see an infestation this bad, there's still no need to panic. This is actually a variety of a tent caterpillar that is pretty rare but these are pictures that actually came into my office uh, approximately two years ago 
from someone who was driving through Topsom, Maine, and just had to stop when they saw the tree in the first photo, that left-hand tree. And then she got up close and was able to take pictures of the second tree or the close up of that tree. And then actually looked at some other surrounding plants where these um, caterpillars had pretty much used up all the available foliage on that tree and were now dropping into you know, the lower story, the understories. And I show this because Again, this is one of those situations where you need to know what you're looking at. Removing this from your tree would be very difficult and it'd be kind of gross and creepy. And we know it won't last until Halloween because otherwise then it would almost be useful. But the fact is you're not going to start scratching or getting a rash or inhaling any hairs from these caterpillars. And knowledge is your best um, a weapon at this point in, in the year, because there are so many look-alike infestations. The time to start worrying is if you see something like this, which is the spongy moth, formerly known as the gypsy moth. And um, this is a moth that pretty much is more seen in Southern and Western Maine, although, it, like the brown tail moth, will come and go. Um, there will be areas that will have infestations, and then a few years later, they won't have any at all. Um, like brown tail moth, it's really dependent on what type of weather we have, such as rainy, cool, you know, weather versus hot, dry weather. This gypsy moth, moth will defoliate trees pretty quickly. A small shrub can be defoliated overnight. Wandering caterpillars will be out there. Um, that means, you know, once they're done eating in one place, they drop down and try and find another source of food. They also have hairs that can irritate the skin. Although in their case, it's more of like a barb as opposed to a chemical. And there can be some severe reactions from people who are allergic to them that result in rashes or itching. So again, if you know what you have, it will be easier to avoid it. And the gypsy moth, now known as the spongy moth, is certainly something you want to avoid. But the reason why you are here is because of the brown tail moth. And the brown tail moth this time of year looks like the little caterpillar on the left of your screen. And come early July through August, it looks like the adult moth that you see on the right side of your screen. And in both cases, the, the hairiness of the body of, these, uh, of this insect are what causes the reactions that people get. So in the case of your caterpillar on the left, this is what they call the fourth instar. And between the third and the fourth instar, well, between all instars, a caterpillar will molt or drop its old skin and a new larger caterpillar will emerge. The brown tail moth does this six times. That's a lot of little skins laying around. The very small skins early in the season, which are essentially the second instar to the third instar, don't have much in the way of hairs. So April and early May are relatively safe times to be out there amongst the trees. And even if you had a pretty bad infestation, chances of getting the rash are less until you get to about Memorial Day and then things start happening. Now we're in the third to the fourth instar. And remember there's a fifth and a sixth instar. And each time those skins are being shed, which means there's nothing inside of them. They're light and fluffy and will get, uh, go on the wind. In addition, they have those hairy, uh, the hairs, which have a little barb at the end. But in addition, that hair is also like a straw. It actually has 
some, some liquid in there, a venom, if you will, that is really toxic to a lot of people. People tend to react, and sometimes in a pretty big way, even with a very little infestation. Um, a lot of folks liken it to a poison ivy rash, where you have the bumps and severe irritation that lasts for, you know, probably a week to three weeks. And the reality is there's no anti-venom for it. The only thing you can do is calm the rash with different type of topical ointments. And if you have a severe case, your doctor might prescribe steroids and or a steroidal cream. Um, and again, it would be a prescription level because if you're severely um, allergic to it, it's just going to be one of those um, things that's not going to go away easily. When we get to the adult stage, all of those little white hairs are also barbed and do have some poison in them, although it's to a lesser degree. And the female brown tail moth does not fly, only the male does. So the chances are you only have half as many um, of the moths themselves out there. But still, they're nothing you want to pick up or touch without gloves and, and ample protection. I think I'll take a second here and ask if anybody has any question about the two pictures we're seeing right here. Okay, the we'll chat, move on then. Chat's open if you need to type. Thank you. So saving your simple is saving your summer is simple as ABC. The first thing is to avoid infested areas April through August. Now, that's easy to say. Sometimes it's difficult to do, but with proper planning, you can mitigate the risk of exposure to those toxic hairs from those falling caterpillar skin, uh, skins. And this, this is one of those areas where um, where they are located makes as big a difference as how many you have. So for instance, if you have an apple tree out in the middle of a field that's four acres, you know, four square acres, chances are those brown tail moth are not going to affect you unless you decide to go and sit down, and read a book underneath the apple tree. They won't travel that far even on the wind. However, if your deck is right next to this beautiful crab apple tree that's been in your yard for years and years, or perhaps you have 60 foot tall oaks shading that deck, planted on purpose so you had a nice cool spot during June, July, and August, that's going to be a problem. One of the ways to avoid those infested areas is to actually take stock of your yard right now. And it's actually easier to do this in the winter, but chances are you will be able to tell if you have brown tail moth either right close to your house or perhaps in the side yard where you might dry your clothes on a clothesline, or maybe it's near um, some other area down by the water or someplace where you might wanna spend some time this summer. If you can avoid the infested areas, that's going to be the easiest thing to do to not get affected by brown tail moth. Then later in the season, you can talk about how, how do I deal with this? The B is be aware and C is call 211 for more information. And I'm gonna go over those, those three things in more detail next. So as I said, the A is for avoid infested areas from April to August. Don't dry your clothes outdoors. Move your lawn furniture and eating areas out from under trees. If you do want shade, you can put up a shade cloth or one of those canopies, um, but know your prevailing winds because the last thing you wanna do is have them blow all into that canopy 
and decide that that's a great place for them to spend their summer. Know those prevailing winds so you can avoid activities downwind of those infected trees. That is especially important, say, around swimming pools or swimming areas. A, a pool cover when you are not swimming is a really good idea. Just be careful as you remove it and put it back on, because if there are any insects on it, that could wreck all the good work you did by covering the pool. Use your nets, use nets to clean those swimming areas where it's possible. Obviously, you know, you can't clean a whole lake, but if you have an area where there's a sandy beach and you're gonna, you know, you're next to a pond and there's really only a certain area where you swim, you can actually go through and kind of move them out of your way. Again, being properly covered, which is kind of weird being in the water fully covered, but that's what you would need to do. You're gonna to wanna to dress appropriately whenever you're in a heavily infested area. So let's say you have to mow the lawn or maybe you're doing some tree trimming or gardening. Generally speaking, they're not going to be out in the open, the wide sunny open space that a vegetable garden likes. However, if the wind is blowing that day, they could get blown into that area. So make sure you're paying attention to the wind and then you're also wearing long sleeves, perhaps long pants, and it's, it's always appropriate to have a hat or a scarf or something else over your hair and your, your neck, because those are some of the areas where if you do get, um, you do have the rash, it can be pretty painful. Some research has shown that using those pre-contact poison ivy wipes available over the counter at the drugstore or that pre-contact lotion, something like that Technu, although I'm not recommending any brands or any specific things, they may help reduce the impacts of exposure. After you get done working in the garden or mowing the lawn, um, and if you're mowing the lawn without a catcher bag, it's probably a good idea to also have a mask on as your, your lawnmower may be blowing those hairs and those skins up at you. But after you're done with whatever you're doing outside, having a um, lint brush handy to wipe down your clothes and then immediately taking a shower and getting those clothes into the wash makes a huge difference. Um, I don't know about you, but I have special shoes for when I'm in the garden. I have special gloves for when I'm doing yard work. All of those things need to be considered as you come in and come out of the garden. You don't wanna bring it indoors or um, set something down on the couch and now those hairs are on your couch and now it's a real problem. B is about being aware of your surroundings. So caterpillars, brown tail moth caterpillars, like it warm and dry. They like warm, dark, dry places to build their cocoons. And their cocoons are brown. So a lot of times they're actually down in the soil. The cocoons are actually made of the hairs. So if you have a big infestation, and you decide to do some gardening starting around the 4th of July and into the early part of August, please be aware about the cocoons. And the resources I'm sharing with you will have really good pictures of those cocoons. Um, moths will lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves of the trees that they like to live in. And that includes the apples, the crab apples, cherries, pears, and oaks are their, their favorites. If none of those plants are around, they will lay their eggs other places. They'll lay them um, on the underside of a leaf of a shrub, or they might uh, uh, put them even on the edge of a house or the trunk of a tree. And again, the resources I'm gonna give you have pictures of those eggs. They're very easy to see, and they're very, um, they're not covered with hair. So they're, they're the one place where 
there are no hairs involved. And so you can clean them up again with some proper precautions because if the moth was there, there could still be some hairs left over, but you can get rid of the eggs. Warm, dry, windy days spread those caterpillars and their skins and hairs. So again, if you think about some of the days that we've had recently, if it's wet and windy, that's gonna weigh down those skins and they're gonna be ending up on the ground fairly quickly. But if it's warm and windy, they can travel quite a ways. When it's cool and wet, the brown tail moth doesn't do well. So in the early spring, early cool wet weather helps a fungus that kills the brown tail moth naturally. So brown tail moth is an invasive species that came from Europe, and there are some natural predators for it in Europe. Some of the fungus and that we have naturally occurring here have also been shown to be um, beneficial to tamping down, especially the very early start of the season, the brown tail moth, when it's in that first and second instar. The tinier the caterpillar, the easier it is for the fungus to kill it. When we get to this time of year, that is lot, a lot less likely because by now the caterpillar has gotten bigger and it takes more of the fungus. And especially this year, we've had a pretty dry spring. So that is not, not in our favor. But when we do get rain, especially a heavy rain, go on out there and clean up those down skins because those are the ones that still have the hairs and the venom in them. So how could you clean them up? I wouldn't recommend using your broom unless you never wanna use that broom for anything ever again. Using a shop vac or using a shovel, something that can be watered down and cleaned out is the best way to deal with it. And once it's in the water, once that skin or even the live caterpillars in the water, um, especially if the water has a little bit of soap in it, that is gonna drown them pretty quickly and then you wanna not bury them. Don't put them in your yard because you might come upon them two or three years from now and still have active venom in them. So you wanna actually put them in the trash or you could burn them once they dried out. But again, burning is really a last resort. Use your hose on a, a really not so gentle spray on a very fierce spray to wash off surfaces that brown tail moth may be on. So for instance, on the side of a fence, on the underside of say a turned over boat. Remember what I said about warm, dry places? Um, if you have something overturned in your yard, it's not holding any water, but yet whatever it is is holding in heat and dry and it's dry underneath, they're gonna wanna crawl up there and put their cocoons and lay their eggs. So using your hose to spray off those surfaces is gonna mitigate your risk a lot. And as I said before, shower immediately after working outdoors. It makes a big difference in how you deal with uh, pests that we really can't th even think about eradicating completely, but management is definitely a possibility. So be aware of your surroundings as well. Know where those moths want to be. Oaks, apples, pears, and crab apples, cherry trees, uh, the, both the ornamental cherry and an actual cherry tree are all really favorite places for them. Areas near, near water also tend to have a little bit more appeal, especially our native oak forests that a lot of times have streams and um, creeks and rivers going through them. Areas near water will need special treatment, especially if you decide to go the chemical route at some point. Um, and the Board of Pesticides Control uh, for the state of Maine has all kinds of information about that. 
But again, this is why we recommend a licensed pesticide applicator because they know those rules. And you certainly don't want to have any kind of pesticide going downstream because it will hurt other caterpillars, even beneficial caterpillars. Be aware of both the barbs and the toxin. The barb is probably the thing that gets your skin initially, but that toxin is extremely stable. And it's been shown to be active for up to three years after the caterpillar died. Both your skin and your respiratory system could be affected by brown tail moth caterpillars. So please be aware if you have somebody in your family or who's visiting that has respiratory issues, I, I can't stress enough that a mask would make a huge different for, difference for them. Inhaling those hairs can be very damaging to your mouth, to your throat, um, to your lungs. If you're healthy, chances are you're not going to notice it. But if you have asthma, if your lungs are somehow compromised, it could become very serious very quickly. And in addition about being aware of your surrounding, surroundings, mapping the problem now will help in the future. And knowing where you saw it this summer and where you saw it last winter will be a big deal. So the map that I'm showing here is the latest brown tail moth web survey. And it's a site that's open to the public and anybody can go to it. And I'm going to attempt to do that right now. And I am going to ask Jill, can you see a map? Oh, you're on mute. I'm muted. I know. Yeah. Um, we can see the map, but nothing has um, popped up like a website, if that's what you were trying for. Um, no, no. I just I wanted to make sure you could see the oh, map. Yeah. Um, so does it say aerial survey, brown tail math tools and web surveys across um, the top? No, it, it, it's a little bit cut off. It simply says latest brown tail web survey. Okay, so let me stop sharing for a minute and reshare. Hold on. How about now? There we go, yes. All right, so this is a map available on the State of Maine site. I will tell you that it's kind of intuitive that the darker the color, the more the problem is, the bigger the problem is. And that um, when I started with the extension back in 2015, my area down here around um, you know, Sagadahuck County, and then up into Androscoggin County, there was nothing there. Only the very fingers of the peninsulas of Sagadahuck County, Lincoln County, and Cumberland County were affected. Whoops, didn't mean for that to happen. Um, now you can see that this infestation has moved north and west. We're seeing it, we've seen some as far away as a rustic county, which is a first. Back in the 1920s, the infestation moved west and south and made it down into the Boston area. Currently, the state of Maine is the only place affected. Lynn, so now I'm I, gonna go to the town of Hope. Right, I was gonna suggest, Lincolnville is like covered in pink. And that's right next to Hope. And so I was hoping that you would uh, give us a clue about what's going on right here. Well, we can do Lincolnville first and then Hope. So this number down in the bottom, 10,900 nests were actually counted in Lincolnville last year at the fall survey. This year, and I hope you can all read the numbers, but we've got Oh, almost 6,600 just here. 
We have another 3,800 here. We have another almost 3,000 here. So we are way over where it was last fall. And that's just these map points that are fairly large. So the, the city of, or the area around Lincolnville um, is worse than it was last year. All these little dots, these, this is called GIS, Arc, Arc GIS mapping. And computer nerds more experienced than I am can really have a fun time on this. They can work with the tools to get really down into a specific area. But basically what has happened is they had two person teams drive down the road, which is why it looks like a square. And they actually mapped those points where they saw nests. And they did an estimated count on each of those points. So for instance, the really dark colors, which is about 5% of this area right now, were mapped with 5,000 plus nests when they were doing the count at that dark point. It's, it's really a very involved process. They do it twice a year. They um, send teams out for basically December through April for this count. So they are counting the nests they see up in the tree. And if they're this year's nest, they can tell versus if it was say last year's nest, even if some of the pieces of that nest were hanging on, if it's in tatters, then they don't count it. I'm gonna go up to hope. So here it's about 12,300 and um, I'm zooming in a little bit, but again, all of these points are kind of around the town of Hope and they are estimating based on what they're seeing additional nests in the same area. And again, as you can see, this area here by Bald Mountain is pretty affected. Um, if we move up and down towards like Union and South Union, there's, there's quite a few that they were able to see from the road. And they, they know that it's going to be worse actually in the interior you know, inside people's yards, inside the wild areas that they can't see from the road. And um, let me just see. So there are ways you can go to the map yourself. And this is one of the resources that I have at the end and that I've shared as an email document that we can um, maybe have Jill send out to you if you want, if you want to get a copy of that. Um, and it's a living document. It will change again when they do the next survey, which will basically be August through November. And there they're looking for not the winter nests, but actually the, um, the defoliation on the trees themselves. So as they drive around in August and September and October, they're not looking for a nest, they're looking for trees that show the characteristic defoliation, usually high up in the canopy, usually um, on the smaller trees, it could engulf a whole tree, but on a say a large oak, it might only be the top quarter or top half of the tree. So they're looking for those signs that there's little tiny caterpillars there. And I'm gonna stop share and move back to my PowerPoint. All right, so you should see the static map now. C is for call 211 for more information. 
So the state of Maine had determined probably almost three years ago that there just weren't enough people in all the extension offices and in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry and in the CDC to answer all the questions we were getting. Um, the person that works Lincoln County for us at the extension, she works Knox and Lincoln, or yeah, Knox and Lincoln. Um, she would get, well, last year she got over 500 calls and she's part-time and works by herself. So obviously it's, it's a difficult challenge to cover those questions ourselves. So the 211 system was engaged with, a, with support from the United Ways of Maine to get the answers out there in the form of frequently asked questions. So those folks who aren't comfortable doing research on a computer could actually pick up the phone and ask questions. Lynn, this would be a good time for me to ask a question that someone has put in the chat. Thank you, Kim. Um, I've heard the same thing, and so it would be helpful for us because we have a light on our barn. And the question is, I've heard that all outside lights should be turned off and solar lights removed at some point to avoid attracting the moths. When is that likely to happen? Well, this is a really good transition because the next thing I was going to talk about was lights. So we'll move on from 211 and we'll talk about D, E, and F. We did our ABCs. This is D, E, and F and darkening your outdoor lights from approximately mid June through mid August is going to be the trick. Um, and I'm going to go into detail on that in a minute. E is every stage of the life cycle matters when it comes to this pest. And then F is the frequently asked questions that are a great resource. And again, those are available through 211 if you want to call, but they're also available online. So I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So moths do like to congregate near lights. And as you can see by the effects of the, on this fence, and actually there's a, the person's garbage is near there. That was a part of their yard where they had a, a light and um, it, it attracts moths, all kinds of moths. They tend to congregate under the lights and they tend to like to fly around at night and then rest during the day. So once they've gotten there, they stay for the day. So if you're thinking, well, can I just like spray them all off? No, that's not gonna work. I mean, you might get a few of them, but that's not the purpose of turning off your lights. The purpose of turning off your lights um, through the last week of June through early August is to stop the moths from finding new homes or from traveling. If you have to have a light on for safety, by all means, keep that light on for safety. But if you know, you're in the house by nine o'clock or 10 o'clock at night, and again, in late June, it's barely dark at that point, um, turn it off for the rest of the night. It's really important that you don't compromise your safety to dissuade these moths from coming to your house. But if you're one of those folks that just automatically has a light on, this might be a good time to kind of take a break from that. Solar lights, we haven't found to be as big of an issue in general. It's more the outdoor lights that are somewhere where the moth can actually hang out. So on a wall or a fence, or maybe on top of a structure that's right underneath the light, like a picnic table, or in some cases, you know, people's cars. 
So this is definitely one of those things that you need to walk around your yard and decide, do I really need this area lit all night long? Because it's really the all night long part that's the problem, not those first couple of hours after dusk or even those hour or so before dawn. Does that answer that person's question? Kim, does that answer your question? Great. Keep those areas clean. Let's say they are all congregated on, you know, right where your garbage cans are or whatever. After a rain, or maybe if you're feeling particularly brave and dressed to kill, you could, you know, rinse them off that part of the fence, shovel them up, put them in a trash bag, and hopefully get rid of some of them but you're not gonna make a material difference on the number of moths in your yard, in your neighborhood, in your community. What it will do is kind of eliminate some of the risk for people going into those areas to bring that bag of garbage to the trash or head it over to the compost pile or some such thing. I have another question. And, sure. Um, I don't want to save it for last, um, but it is sort of one of those last questions, which is, are these buggers ever going to go away? Or is this a permanent thing for us? Well, they've been around since the 1890s when they came in from Europe. They were stowaways on a ship. They came into Boston and spread up the coast. And by the 1920s, we had a really ridiculous infestation throughout the whole eastern coast from Boston up through southern Maine. In Europe right now, they're still a problem. They've been a problem for many, many years there. And especially in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of research going on. Are we ever gonna get rid of them completely? My guess is no. Are we gonna learn strategies to control them or, or lessen the numbers? Absolutely. There's a lot of research being done in Europe around that. And in fact, that's where some of the newest chemicals, especially those injectable chemicals have come from is from European research. But to be totally honest, there's not enough of a problem in the United States for research money to go this way. Remember, I said Maine's the only state being affected by them right now. So, you know, that leaves basically a very small number of places where research is being done and it's being underwritten. It's, it's a fact of life. You know, the, the gypsy moth affects way more area from New Hampshire through Ohio and the Midwest that's gonna get, you know, the squeaky caterpillar gets the, the, the worm, so to speak, or whatever that saying is. So the life cycle of this pest makes it really hard to control as well. And this graphic, although not exactly the most accessible if you're using a screen reader, is available on the, the main DACF page with a lot better explanations before it and after it. But right now we're in that second downward pointing purple area. Insecticide treatment should have happened already, especially considering how warm we were a couple of weeks ago, according to the brown tail moth, it's summer. And insect, insecticide treatment has to happen before that moth gets too big or that caterpillar gets too big. It's way easier to kill a tiny caterpillar than it is to kill a big caterpillar. And even if you did kill the big caterpillars, their bodies are still full of those toxic hairs. And as they drop out of the trees or drop off the side of your house or wherever they're at, they're still, it's like hazardous waste. Uh, although 
not technically known as hazardous waste. Let's just be clear about that, but they're still going to be a problem. So that April through June period is a relatively active time for them. And then when we get into June or July, that's when they go into their cocoons. So that's when they become the pupae. And there's actually the risk for the hairs are from the molted bodies and also from the fact that the cocoons are made up of the hairs. So you literally have to have physical contact with them. And chances are that's going to happen on the ground as opposed to flying through the air. Then we get into August and the adults are around. And the adults, although they have the hairs, are not really as big of an issue because they don't have as many hairs. But using and that idea of limiting your outdoor lights will help take those caterpillars somewhere else, hopefully somewhere that's you know not next to your house by your back door. When we get into basically July and August as well, the eggs are there and the eggs really don't present a huge problem. They have a few hairs on the, the egg mass, but it's not a huge problem. That's why you're seeing it in green. And when you get to August, September, the larvae are there again, but they're so tiny they don't have the hairs yet. And this is actually the time when you're going to find out what your problem is going to look like next year. And treatment may be not only possible, but more effective. But again, it's not recommended for near marine waters if you're using a spray. And this is when a lot of the injectables, the injectable chemicals come into play. But again, we highly recommend you're working with a professional on that because the size of the tree, the size of the infestation, the type of tree all have to be figured in. And so it's not an easy do-it-yourself type um, situation. So again, the life cycle, I'm going to start with the eggs because we know which came first, the caterpillar or the egg. It was the egg. So the eggs are laid in August and September. The tiny caterpillars hatch and they molt up to two times. Remember, it's six times total, but they molt up to two times. At that point, those are usually fairly high up in the tree already. So the female um, moth doesn't fly very much but she does climb up the tree and she builds that nest using a leaf that is going to be um, protecting those little tiny caterpillars as they hatch. And they'll start eating those leaves at the top of the tree. And each of those leaves that become a nest can hold up to four or 500 tiny caterpillars. And they, they get born being really hungry. As they eat, they grow and they molt at least once, sometimes twice. Now it's the, the later fall into the winter, basically October through March. This is when you see those characteristic nests up in the tree at the very tippy top of a branch. So if you're seeing a nest at the sort of the V or the crook of a branch, that's not brown tail moth. That's probably a fall tent caterpillar or an eastern tent caterpillar. The nests of these caterpillars are literally at the tip of the branch. Then April, May, and June, these caterpillars wake up. They start eating. They're going to molt four more times. So however many little caterpillars you had, multiply the number of, of those by four, that's how many skins are flying around. And then in late June, they build a cocoon, again, that has some hairs in it, 
And then in August, those adults hatch and fly and lay eggs. A lot of it is dependent on the weather. A cold, damp spring will hold things back and you might not see you know, a lot of movement until May and it might you know, go into mid-June. A warm, dry spring, those, those caterpillars are gonna be out fairly early. They're gonna go back into the nest at night. They're gonna defoliate the tops of trees. And then as the, the summer moves on, they're gonna probably be pupating in June as opposed to July. So again, it's all pretty weather dependent as well. One of the things you wanna watch out for in summer are hitchhikers. Now there's a lot of pests that hitchhike. And the reason we have things like brown tail moth is because it hitchhiked at some point on something in the past. And what we're showing in this first picture is sort of the top of the tire near the wheel well. Remember, warm, dry. They like the feel of that. They're gonna hang out there. How about on your truck bed or even just near your windshield? These things are pretty, um, pretty clever when it comes to places they can hide. If you have a boat that's turned upside down and now you flip it over, they could be under that boat. Maybe that boat's been sitting in your yard all winter and now you bring it to the lake. You've just moved a hitchhiker or 200 to the lake. The last thing I really wanna talk about is F, which are the facts. And the facts, which stands for frequently asked questions are pretty comprehensive. When printed, these facts are 21 pages long. That's because each fact, even though it looks a lot shorter on screen, you can open it up and you can look through it. And again, I'm gonna to attempt to open up the fact page and then I'm gonna stop share and then start share on the fact page. So these, you should be seeing something that says brown tail moth, BTM, frequently asked questions. Am I, are you guys seeing that, Jill? Okay. So these cover all the things I've pretty much talked about, the life cycle, the management, pesticides, human health, animal health, toxic care exposure, and then policy. Um, I'm gonna to go to one that's pretty simple, which is public policy. When you click on it, it opens it up and there's four different resources. When you click on that, it's going to have what that resource talks about. So this is basically telling you why we can't eradicate it at the state level. It's because it, it hides. And then when we do have it, it's big pretty quick. So what are they doing? They're committed to coordinating um, with municipalities. The main CDC is working to provide information for healthcare providers. A lot of those folks that got brown tail moth, the first one in their first one on the block, so to speak, that healthcare provider may not have been aware of it. On the other hand, where I live in the Brunswick Topsum area, Mid Coast Hospital had been dealing with this since 2013, 2014, and they knew it just by looking at it. And as you go through there, you can then just close that up and go to the next one. So all of these different topics are covered and when you open them all up, that's when it's 21 pages long. There's some additional related links and then there's what they call the battle book. And I'm gonna go back to um, my presentation for this part of that.
if anyone has any questions, now would be a really good time to drop them in the chat. The municipal battle book was created in the last two years to help municipalities understand the process of dealing with this and hopefully allocate some resources to it. And different towns have handled it different ways, but it's super important to realize that without input from the, com the community, your municipality may not be aware of just how bad things are. Um, during the middle of winter, they're busy, you know, getting snow off the road, dealing with salt, dealing with ice and ice in and ice out and all that stuff. Um, it really does take a village when it comes to getting rid of those nests in the winter time. First of all, knowing where they're at. And secondly, finding the resources to take care of those nests. There have been some really successful towns doing this. On the other hand, towns that have a lot of um, public open space or areas that are um, you know, part of a, a, a land trust or something else where there may not be a lot of roads are really difficult to deal with this, this pest. You know, a municipality can always take care of playgrounds, school grounds, public parks a lot more easily than they can take care of a wild area. It's not that it's impossible, but it does cost a lot of money. And quite frankly, there's, you know, there's never enough money for everything we wanna get dealt with. The other resource is called Knockout Brown Tail Moth. And again, I have all sorts of these listed uh, in a document that can be sent to you. So you can just click on it and it will take you right to the resource. This is updated regularly. If you looked at knockout brown tail moth in the early spring, it would have talked about clipping nests. A little while later, it would, it would have talked about identifying where the problem is and basically trying to um, get professionals lined up to have you deal with it. Right now we're focusing on hitchhikers because it is a big issue. And those hitchhikers coming in from other parts of the state that have brown tail moth to places that don't and vice versa are pretty important. In the fall, if you know you have brown tail moth, that is the time to schedule professional help for the winter and spring. Whether you decide to clip nests, or use insecticides applied by a professional, all of those folks book up really early. So getting them ahead of time, especially if you know and have a really good idea of what the coverage needs to be, you know, how bad is it in your yard, being able to do that in the fall will help those professionals, you know, basically get you on the books. And then I can take questions and I just wanna show you, again, all the resources are available as clickable links and Jill has a copy of that. Um, I sent it to her, I guess, yesterday. So I can stop sharing my screen now and we could, um, if we need to do some questions and go back to the screen, it's easy enough. Um, so I do have, the Google Doc that Lynn sent, and I have everyone's email address. And uh, over this weekend, I will do my best to send you um, what's in the Google Doc. And if you have additional questions, um, or there's something not in there, or I missed something, or whatever, I'll get in touch with Lynn, and I'm sure she'll help us out. And uh, this has been recorded. So if you wanted to go back and, and find that URL or whatever it is, um, can do that. Um, you can also share it with your neighbors once I've shared it with you. So um, actually, I'll probably try to send one email to everyone. The email would have the YouTube recording link in it and the uh, resource information, um, just to keep your email a little smaller. So um, I'm not seeing any uh, questions anymore in the, um, in the chat. Um, 
I will say that on behalf of the Hope Library, we're really proud to um, offer this kind of resource to the community. And if you do have a chance, pop into the town office during town office hours and check out our little library, which is basically an honor system library. We do have volunteers on hand Tuesday mornings and Friday mornings. Um, but we're here for you. And if you have suggestions on other topics that we can address, we're happy to hear those too. Um, and it, one last thing, if you have a question that occurs to you after you've jumped off the Zoom, um, you can send them to me, I'll send them to uh, send them the Hope Library, I'll send them to Lynn, and we'll get you some answers. Um, so on behalf of all of us at Hope Library, I guess I just want to say good night because we've got some thank yous in the chat, but um, nothing more than that. And um, I'll stay tuned for the recording. I'm going to end recording right now. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>